Thank you very much, Neil, and uh, congratulations, uh, Jonathan and the team, for uh, bringing us another in Darba. We're looking forward to the next few days. Um, Honourable Minister, His Royal Highness, Ministers, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. I think um, for me today, I'll be focusing on more global aspects of the industry. Uh, I was asked to make some observations of a more general nature, but also to bring those home in terms of what it means for us in the industry, both locally and in particular in Africa. And so maybe I think a, a good place to start is to acknowledge the minister and his speech. And for me, it was encouraging to hear his uh, priorities where he articulated the uh, conclusion of the design of the MPRDA, the mining charter and its application across our industry, the focus on social and labour plans and making sure that we really do have a sustainable model for our industry going forward, political stability. Every industry looks for that stability in thinking about investments in the country. All absolutely critical issues and ones that we're aligned on and certainly we'll try and do our part to make sure that we create a stable and growing industry for the future. I'd like to make or add one point from an industry perspective um, and I think it does touch on the issue of how we should partner within the countries in which we operate. Growth only comes with productivity and investment. I actually support the Minister's words, the use of dignity and respect. It's through dignity and respect, treating people with dignity and respect that we can motivate and help people become more productive. But without productivity, we don't have a future and again I'd like to say thank you to the Minister for acknowledging that most important word. In the short term, as they say, it may not be the most important issue, but in the long term it's the only issue. And on investment, investment follows returns. It's not the other way around. To build the future South Africa in particular, we may need to make sure that we're partners in productivity and investment. And that's the only way we'll grow the country sustainably with everyone sharing an appropriate piece of that pie. Now reflecting on the industry, I started with Anglo-American around 33 months ago and for those that are in the industry you've been watching like I have a long decline in commodity prices and I think in those 33 months I can only remember one month where I think prices went up. If I break that at that reduction in prices into percentage terms, it's about one and a half percent per month drop in our prices over the period that I've been enrolled. And from our company's point of view on a revenue base, that's $350 million a month decline in our revenues. It's a big number and it's a big number for the industry. In our case, we've taken about 30% of the costs out of the business, although inflation's obviously taken some of that back, and we need to do a lot more, and I guess you'll have to wait to next week to find out how much more we think we can do in the next 12 months and beyond as we continue to restructure and create a new Anglo-American. As the industry faces the turbulence that we see, I'd have to say in the short term it probably is not going to change much and I think 2016 may in fact be tougher than 2015. But when we come out of it on the other side, certainly in our case we'll be a much different and certainly a much stronger group and I hope the next time we go through these cycles, as the Minister says, we'll be much better prepared for the winter that inevitably comes after the summer. So. In numbers that people can relate to in this room, and again, I say this more for some of the commentators, at the start of 2013, the aggregated market cap of mining stocks in the FTSE all share was $550 billion. On the 1st of January this year, it was down to $169 billion. 
the equivalent figures on the JSE around 2.8 trillion down to 1.3. In the UK, we're down 70%. In South Africa, we're down 50%. And I guess that tells you something about exchange rate variations between the two countries. Global mining stocks have lost around $1.4 trillion of market value, as I said, around half of their value, more than the combined value of Apple, ExxonMobil, and Google, and their Bloomberg statistics. Frightening numbers. It's not new to anyone in this room, but it does give you a macro sense of the challenges we all face. For a start, mining stocks, along with the oil and gas sector, have experienced the steepest price falls on the world's borders that is not just an extractive industry downturn. China's growth is moderating off a high base as the country's pol policymakers try to rebalance its economy from its heavy industry and infrastructure development phase towards a more sustainable and commercial-based economy. There is sluggishness, sluggishness in other emerging markets, India being the standout exception, but there's slow progress in the Eurozone and mixed, though broadly positive, progress in the US. On the supply side, however, the industry has itself largely to blame, particularly in certain commodities. It's the old story of what appears rational to the detached observer, that is, to adjust supply to align with decreasing demand growth, may not make sense to the price maker who, in seeking to at least maintain market share, sees the compelling logic of competitors being driven out of business, thereby ensuring that he's the last man or woman standing. That strategy over the years has turned out to generally be net negative on both the doer and the doe, particularly where supply responses occur after the fact. That is, in most cases, once that supply capacity has beat it, been built out, it doesn't disappear. It may stop for a period of time, but it will come back. And it does require, I think, a different logic in terms of the way markets progress and to be successful in those markets, particularly for those leaders of industry. In our own case, in the diamond industry, as De Beers, we saw pressure in the markets. We saw that the demand for our product had slowed and we took appropriate action. I guess next week you'll find out whether we believe that action has had an impact. And for those that saw our first sales results in the year, I'd like to think that we're on the right or going in the right direction. Obviously, we still have to wait for a couple of months, but certainly the signs are encouraging. There is no doubt that the downturn in mining commodities is having a major detrimental impact on people, supply chains, and governments wherever we work. From Western Australia to South Africa to Brazil, Chile and the US, resource-rich countries had grown to use the fruits of healthy taxes and royalties in all of their planning and budgeting and now feeling the pressure. They now have to make difficult choices as they've squeezed the pips dry on mining's golden goose, if you allow me to mix a few metaphors. Moreover, we can't rely on a reversal of this price slump anytime soon. For many of us in the industry, 2016 is already shaping up to be probably the toughest yet. But from adversity comes opportunity, and as a group, we are thinking very hard about the new Anglo-American in terms of the future. And as a company, we've had to remake ourselves many times, and this is one of those moments where we will significantly remake and refocus the business as all good businesses should do when the opportunity comes and the demands of the market put you in the position where the choices have to, the tough choices have to be made. For all miners at the same time, as many endeavor to repair balance sheets and staunch cash outflow, we are facing a great many other pressures. Water, energy, safety, the environment, social scrutiny, the list goes on. Each one of them legitimate and absolute imperative for us to be successful in to create successful businesses. Addressing those challenges will require us to think differently, to innovate, to rebuild the very nature of our companies. If we don't adapt, 
we perish. All of this work and the challenges that we face have led many to ask, are mining companies prepared for the future? In my view, in the last 20 to 30 years, we've not prepared ourselves for the current reality we face. It's only those companies that are quick and able to adjust that will be successful in terms of the new world that we confront. We have seen it before, probably not as tough as we've seen it given the size and depth of the, the boom that we've just come off. But at the end of the day, for those of us that have been around long enough, we know what we have to do, we'll get on and we'll do it. For us though, I think there's something different about what we're confronted with. For us, we have to think differently about the future and whilst we can learn from the past, we have to make sure that we're not confined or constrained by the lessons of the past. There are many new things we have to think about and respond to in the world as it stands today. Today I'm going to touch briefly on three themes. <coughs> the world is changing at an ever faster rate. Again, I'll talk about most of that change in South African and African context. Secondly, we can't merely look at the past to guide the future because I think we'll be making some major mistakes, in particular in terms of the markets and the markets we have to serve and the way we serve those markets. And then three, what does that mean for an Anglo-American? How are we evolving and what are the things we're thinking about in terms of creating a new future for our business? Throughout its long history, as I've said, Anglo-American has had to go through significant change. It has made and remade itself. And we're at one of those moments in history again. It's an exciting time. It's a tough time. But the restructuring that we're going through is a necessary process to ensure that after 99 years, we're preparing ourselves for the second 100 years of this great company. In terms of the world, certain emerging economies are maturing. There is no doubt. Their needs are changing, and we must recognise and be in a position to respond to those secular trends. China is moving from its infrastructure fuel growth to a consumer-led economy. It will be a bumpy ride, but it is a super tanker that is not going to stop. Despite its slowdown, which may well be more pronounced than official figures suggest, in terms of absolute quantities of minerals, the dragon is consuming more in annual in increments than it was even a decade ago, when GDP growth was still in double digits. It will continue to absorb more min minerals, much more. Indo India is following. The IMF predicts growth of 7.5% ahead of China, but the nature of that growth will be different, again, more consumer-based, and therefore, as a mining company, we have to think about and respond to those changes in the market, understanding what that means. The US is at the far end of the consumer scale and will be a critically important market for global consumption, from cars and electronics to luxury goods and jewellery. With all the distractions of China, people tend to forget that the US, with a 40% share, is still by some distance the largest single market for diamond jewellery, for example. In our case, all I can say is thank God for De Beers. Then there's Africa. The continent has more than a billion people and is set to be, the great to be a great consumer society. The key issue is when. His Royal Highness, I think, gave a great description of the things required for Africa to be successful. The real question is, are we listening and do we understand how to work together to, to create or convert great potential to reality. Much of Africa is only at the start of its journey with a lot of work needed to be done to make sure it's in a position to attract the funding it needs for infrastructure as the foundation for its economic development. And funding relies on good governance, stable policy frameworks so that both create the right climate for investment and returns so that that debt that's required to fund those initiatives is repaid. If we don't repay the debt, if we don't deliver returns on that debt, then we don't have a future. 
nor must funding be the preserve of global institutions such as the World Bank, the IMF and the IFC on the one hand and big state-backed players on the other. If Africa is to prosper, the private sector must not stand on the sidelines. It has an important role to play to enable this growth. As I alluded to yesterday in the ministerial symposium, when we look at the African vision of 2009, it will remain a vision, or if I can put it more bluntly, it will remain a dream unless you're able to engage private enterprise business in investments across the continent. We all need to engage, we all need to listen, we all need to work together to create and deliver the potential that Africa is. South Africa, of course, stands apart in Africa and is advantaged in many ways with highly developed physical and financial infrastructure, world-class technology and medical science, an independent judiciary, world-class technology, independent, as we said, and we all know an enviable natural resource endowment. We are also acutely aware that South Africa has experienced a fallout from the economic slowdown and the effects of the downturn in the commodity markets, like all countries. And like every mining jurisdiction, this great mining country also has challenges of its own. We have seen time and time again how a collaborative approach between government, labour and the private sector is the only way to find lasting and positive solutions. And whilst we've had our moments, the fact that we've come together in the PAKISA process is encouraging. I think the only question I have is, has it gone far enough? But if we reflect on the lessons that we've learned, for example, in safety, South Africa has reduced its fatality frequency rate by 90% over the last 20 years. In the last five years, it has been the single best in terms of level of improvement mining industry in the world. The, that level of improvement has to continue for us to achieve what we want to achieve, but I think safety is a good example of how we can collaborate and work together and achieve amazing outcomes. And it should be the model in terms of working together on the PAKISA initiatives and bringing together South Africans to make a great South Africa. We can't look to the past to guide the future. We are all too often guilty of looking in the rear mir view mirror to try and predict the future. It is human nature. For us, as a mining industry, we must, of course, learn the lessons of the past, but we should not fixate on the past as a guide. For example, looking at things more broadly, we have seen how disruptive technology can be. In Africa and in many developing countries, mobile phones have largely, largely displaced any plans for hugely expensive infrastructure required for universal fixed-line telephony. They have also disrupted, in a positive way, long-established banking models based on networks of physical buildings. What else must we and those responsible for national planning be thinking about? What's next? What is going to happen? And more importantly, what is not going to happen? Should developed nation, national governments really be investing hundreds of billions of dollars in increasing commuting capacity on the roads and railways instead of the next generation broadband to enable people to work seamlessly from their homes. Technology is changing and society's needs and expectations are changing in tandem. One is driving the other, it is perpetual. Coming back to mining, we are fortunate in one respect. The physical nature of resources is a constant. Certainly our understanding is not a constant. And at least on any reasonable time scale, we are all aware of the challenges in finding those resources and bringing them to market. As mining companies, we know what operations we have and what untapped resources we have. We therefore have a pretty good idea of what we need to do to be successful. What we don't know is how the markets will develop and anticipating and thinking about those markets and how we better serve those markets is going to be a key for us being successful. Many of the people here have heard me talk about mining processes have been largely unchanged for many decades. Larger scale, yes, but old technology. The paradigm is changing. You will hear Robert Friedland uh, in the next couple of days talk about new technologies, and he's scratching on the right stuff. 
at Anglo American, we're pushing along with our future smart program, even with the challenges we face, because we believe there are step breakthroughs that will change the paradigms in our industry. I expect later this year to be able to talk to some significant changes we'll make in our copper business. It's too early to go through any details, but the work that we're doing with our teams are certainly going to make a difference and will change the face of our company and our competitive positioning in the industry. We're going for step change. It takes time and it's important. It's a bit like a discussion I had with um, a shareholder regarding costs and costs out. And I said that the acceleration people have seen in our cost reduction work in the last 18 months is a function of the work we did in the first 12 months. Getting a truck from 4,000 hours a year to 6,500 hours a year means we have to reconstruct every process that we have. We have to make people changes. We have to change so many other things. But when you hit that 6,500 hours, the reduction in cost, you've reduced your capital by 40%, you've reduced your operating cost by 30%, and it's sustainable. It's easy to cut costs in six months, but when you've delivered it over a couple of years, it stays out and you have a very different business. And that's how we're taking our business forward. And again, we'll set that table next week and talk about where we're up to and what we're looking at doing going forward. Finally, in talking about the new Anglo-American, we talk about the opportunities we see in probably the toughest time we've seen in most of our lives in terms of this industry. And for me, that screams new opportunity. That's what we're working on. That's what we're working with. And in fact, many of the people in this room we're collaborating with in terms of de developing new models and approaches to the way we do our work. Given the world around us, the need to establish a more robust balance sheet as a platform for the future and the long-term economic trends that we see require us to do things differently. We are a self-help group. We understand that our shareholders demand we do the best with the resources we have and we'll deliver on those expectations and the future potential that we see within the business. Finally, in wrapping up or talking to the future for both Africa, South Africa and our company as a key player across the continent, we talk about partnerships and the way we need to work together. The world is changing at a faster rate than any of us have probably been able to digest certainly in the last five years, and it'll get faster. The key question is, can we position ourselves as a country, as a continent, and as a company that partners at each level within our community in developing the future? Can we work together and get ahead of the curve and help lift Africa up to and above and beyond other competitors across the, across the globe? This conference is about us listening, sharing ideas, and working out how we create, can create a different success for all of our stakeholders and as a company to be a successful part of that partnership. We need to innovate in every sense of the word. We literally need to throw the old models of how we've done business in the dustbin. We have to do it with people. We have to treat people with dignity and respect. In productivity terms, we can't do 10 or 20%. It has to be 100% improvement in the next two to three years for us to really position ourselves in a very different place. That's where we're going. That's where I know most of the people in this room want to go. And from our part or from our perspective, we're thrilled and honoured to be a partner with the Indaba, with South Africa and all South Africans, and with everyone in Africa and on the continent. It's great to be here and I hope you have a great four days. Thank you.